Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're just going to give one or two minutes so that everybody, if there's anyone's having technical difficulties, they can join. But thank you so much for joining us on this stormy and icy day. Well, maybe you had nothing better to do. So I'm I'm happy that you're here and we'll get started in a few minutes. You can turn on your camera too if you want. Actually, I have that disabled just to keep the um the uh Our bandwidth bandwidth, but uh, maybe with this number of participants, we'll give okay. it a try and then if it's not working, okay. Um, It'd be yeah, nice if we can. Huh? Let's try it out. But okay. It's more like Real people, I'm not talking just to myself. <laughs> I know. Okay, are we good to are we good to start? Hi everyone, good evening. I think uh, many of you know who I am. I'm the counselor for Ward 18, Alta Vista. Uh, just one second, sorry. So thank you very much for attending this evening. Um, Early when I was elected, I decided that I would love to do a, an environmental series so uh, where we have webinars on different topics. And I'm absolutely thrilled that Melanie uh, has agreed to, to speak to us tonight from the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library. I've always found we're really fortunate to have the volunteers that we do in the community who are working on environmental initiatives. And we see that all over our ward and all over the city. And uh, the work that Melanie's done is absolutely excellent. Um, in terms of gardening with native plants, which is something that is so important when we're trying to uh, ensure biodiversity uh, in our communities and, and make a commitment to to climate change. So I will, um, to addressing climate change, I should say, um, I will turn it over to Melanie, but just uh, before starting, so Melanie's going to give a presentation in English, mais um, si vous avez des questions en français, uh, je, je, je sais que Mélanie est bilingue et moi aussi, uh, avec un gros accent. Uh, mais merci beaucoup d'être ici ce soir. And just, um, I may log off a little bit early, so just before I turn it over to her, we will have another presentation on, I think it's April 27th, on uh, dog strangling vine removal as well. Mm. So we'll keep you up to date um, on the presentations that we're having, but I'll, I'll turn you over to Mélanie now. Hi everybody, can you see my screen? Good, it's lovely to meet all of you. I encourage you to use uh, your camera if you feel comfortable doing it. Uh, my name is Melanie Willett and I'm the chair and founder of the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library. And so today there is about 20 of us. And so I want to encourage you, um, you know, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to drop something in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can take questions as I go. I'd like for this to be more of an informal discussion than for me to have a formal presentation and you know just talk and talk and talk. So feel free to you know ask your questions and there are no stupid questions. And uh, I also have uh, lots of pictures in my presentation too. So if you have questions on the pictures too, feel free to let me know. Um, before we start, I would like to ask you um, if you feel um, comfortable sharing what your expectations are for this presentation, if there's some topics you want me to cover, um, and I will write it down, and then I'll make sure to, um, you know, mention it during our presentation, or at the end, I'm going to go through all of the um, elements I will have written down to make sure that I've covered all the topics you came here to learn about. So um, you can either raise your hand or write something in the chat. It's up to you. Nobody has anything? No expectations? Oh, I can see somebody's typing. Well, 
Well, I don't see any hands, so. Does it have a Teams account? Can you verify? Oh, Melanie, okay. maybe I can ask a question. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. So I was wondering whether in your presentation you're going to talk about private gardens or whether you will also be addressing sort of public gardens. I will know? talk about uh, things that apply to both. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So you're good to continue. <laughs> so I guess I don't see any questions, so I'm going to go ahead to the next slide. Second. Okay, so first of all, a little bit of definitions here. Uh, you're going to hear me use the term native plants. And so when I use the term native plants, uh, it means the plants that were here and uh, prior to European settlement. And so they are the plants that have co-evolved with our wildlife and that have been around in this region for thousands of years. And so these are all like plants that grow in our region that I took pictures of. Well, I'm going to start with a little quiz. I have a few quizzes uh, during the presentation. And so what I'm going to do is read out the question. And if you want to put what you think the answer is in the chat. So and then I'm going to reveal the answer. So I have a few of those during the presentation. So I can start native plant seeds under grow lights, like for vegetable and herb seeds. Yes, no. Or it depends. So let me see what you put in the chat. No, it depends. Yes. So we're getting different uh, answers here. So the right answer is Jerome. It depends, likely not. <laughs> so our native plants have evolved uh, to be able to sustain our winters, and most of them need to go through what is called cold moist stratification, which is a freeze and thaw cycle that helps them soften their shell so then they can germinate. And so uh, typically the most of them require cold moist stratification. So if you were just to take your seeds and put them under grow lights, they likely will not germinate. Um, to be able to make them go through cold moist stratification, um, you can sow them outdoors. Uh, typically we recommend like in the, either in the fall or winter in pots or jugs or clamshells. If you can see above, that's like a spinach container uh, that you can use to create a mini greenhouse. And the two pictures at the bottom are also like pots. Oh, I just read somebody else. And then uh, if you want to put them in um, under grow lights, uh, you can also start them in the fridge before and then put them under grow lights. So why are native plants crucial? Why are we so, um, you know, why do we put so much emphasis on native plants? So as I mentioned before, like plants and wildlife, they've been co-evolving together for thousands of years. And so what does that look like? Uh, so that means, for example, that certain types of native bees will emerge in the springtime as some uh, native trees will be in bloom. So then there's a codependency there, whereas the bees need the trees to be able to have some food. And then the tree rely on the bees to get pollinated and then reproduce. And um, it's also, for example, like uh, some plants have like a uh, little tube blooms and that may matches the length of the uh, tubes match the length of the hummingbird bees. So hummingbirds pollinate the plant and then the plant in exchange get po gets pollinated. And so the same goes for uh, some caterpillars depend on certain plants. Um, and because they've evolved to be able to digest certain chemical components. And so they depend on these plants also to survive. And so what's been happening for the last few hundreds of years is that we've imported some plants from Europe and Asia and so forth. Plus, we've also introduced plants that we've modified because we find them aesthetically pleasing. 
for example, like longer blooms or different colors, different foliage, different heights. And so what happens is these, you know, new plants and modified plants have been introduced faster than our local wildlife can adapt. And so part of why it's important to grow native plants is to make sure that we help support those co-dependencies. Pollinator gardens also are important, and that's something that we, you know, we hear that terminology thrown out there all the time. But pollinator actually means uh, the adult stage of butterflies, for example. And so what we want to do is support the full life cycle of butterflies, for example, or beetles and, and bees that, you know, depend on certain foliage or plants to be able to survive. And so native plants support their full life cycle instead of just when they're adults. And they also provide the nutrition, they also provide the nutrition that uh, these different species need and that they've grown accustomed to eating. So why should you grow like a native plant garden? And so typically the way, you know, the, the traditional gardening has gone is that you go to the nursery or the store, you see something you find pretty, you bring it back to your garden, and then you're like, oh, how can I grow this here? Do I need to use fertilizer? Should I use pesticides? Do I need to amend the soil? Or maybe I need to water it over and over again because, you know, like it's, it needs to be watered because it's not meant to be in this kind of climate. What we do when we talk about native plant guard gardening is that we ask ourselves, like, how many hours of direct sunlight do we get? How much water do we get? What kind of soil do I have to work with? Then once we've identified the conditions, we choose the right plants for the right spots. So by choosing the right plants for the right conditions, we there's no need for fertilizers, to use pesticides. And then once your little seedlings are established, you don't need to water them because these plants are used to grow without human intervention. And so in the long term, it's also uh, less work. So what does the seed library do? And so uh, we provide free native seeds and plants so that you can check out. So similar to what you would find at a library, you know, when you go to the library, you check out books, you read them, and then you bring them back. The concept of the seed library is the same, except it's, it's with seeds. So we give you free native seeds, and then once your flowers have bloomed and they've gone to seeds, we ask you to return the seeds so we can um, share them with people and hopefully grow and grow that uh, chain of reciprocity. So these are different pictures of different types of seeds uh, that we offer. Uh, we also um, have some processes in place to make sure that we preserve the genetic integrity of our plants. Uh, we only share what's called straight species. So a straight species is the genetic you would typically find in the wild. Um, store sometimes will sell what's called like cultivars. So cultivars mean uh, cultivated variety. So there are plants that are created to present certain characteristics, like I've said before, and that are cloned over and over and over and sold as such. And you can typically recognize the cultivar when you look at the plant tag. Uh, the Latin name is there, and then you will have in quotation marks um, the marketing name that they've given to the, plant, the species. And so the, I put an example here. If you look at the right hand side of your screen, you can see the straight species. So Floxibulata or moss phlox, um, that's a native species that we have in Ontario. And so the native species is a beautiful and violet color. And then the cultivar that you, you can buy at nurseries here, I actually grew this uh, myself before I knew about cultivars. Um, that's called Scarlet Flame, so that's the cultivar name. And so that one uh, was specifically created to be able to uh, have longer blooms, bloom in more like shade areas, shorter, and also like present like a very um, bright pink color. So we don't accept cultivars, only straight species. And we ask uh, when people are not sure to not donate the, the seeds. So this is the seed libraries impact. So uh, 
the seed library started in October 2020. And so we just finished our third season of giving seeds away. Um, we start giving seeds in October because um, we follow the same uh, life cycle of our plants here. Like our plants will bloom, like, you know, in um, start, starting in June until October, November-ish, then they go to seed. And so right at the time when they go to seed is when we start giving away plants. And then to uh, follow the cold moist stratification cycle I mentioned uh, before, we give them away until February. And so um, we've given to 1,300 people this year only, 16 plus public schools, community gardens, other seed libraries. And you know, not only do we have the numbers, but we also have the diversity. We've given away 177 different species. So that's a lot of um, biodiversity for our region and for our third year only. So like sometimes people like they hear about the native plants and like, oh my God, how do I maximize my impact? And so one of the ways you can maximize, you know, get the biggest bang for your buck in your garden is to grow what is called keystone species. And keystone species mean that if these species were to disappear, part of the ecosystem would disappear with them. So there are so many species that depend on them to survive that if they were to disappear, these species would also disappear with them. And so I include like these, this is not like an exhaustive list. I just put like five there just to give you an idea of what it can look like. Uh, it's not, you know, just plants, it's also trees. There's also some animals that are part of that list. Um, so for example, like the oak tree is one of the examples that's used the most. Uh, so this is a picture of a white oak that grows behind my house in the Hiawatha Park in Orleans. And so uh, white oaks support 445 different caterpillar species. And so more than 400 species use, use it as a host plant, meaning that they depend on this uh, tree and other like species like this one uh, to survive. And so I also have a picture example here of goldenrod. You see them around uh, quite a lot. And so for the goldenrod here, um, there's 120 different caterpillar species. So of butterflies and moths that depend on goldenrod to survive. And 22 uh, different types of specialized native bees. So bees also have host plants. And so, you know, there's more to uh, the list than these five, but I just wanted to give you an example so that, you know, when you choose trees for your property, you choose plants and you want to maximize their impact, look for host plants to get the maximum um, impact. I'm just gonna, okay, so feel free also to ask questions in the chat. I'm gonna keep monitoring it as I go. Another quiz. So our native bees live in hives. True or false? Oh, she's raising her hand. Christine. Christine, do you want to ask a question? So that's good. Everybody's got the answer to that one. False. Our honeybees that live in hives are not native. And um, we're lucky to have 400 native bee species in Ontario, and 90% of them are solitary bees. So solitary bees mean that they live by themselves and that all of the work is done by single moms. So the moms are responsible for collecting the food, laying the eggs, and building the nest. And so um, they're not aggressive typically because they, you know those moms are busy and they have other things to do in life than you know worry about us. <laughs> and our native bees are also like two or three times better pollinators than honeybees. That's an unknown fact. Um, and they also nest in various locations. So that can include the ground, uh, different wood cavities, for example. Uh, they can also uh, nest in stems. Um, 
And the reason why they don't get as much promotion as honeybees is because um, they don't have really an industry that is backing them up. And also, um, like farmers prefer honeybees, even though they're less effective as pollinators because they can control where they put them better. Whereas our native bees are kind of all over the place and it's hard to make sure that they're at the right place at the right time. So um, all the pictures of, that you see on the screen are pictures that I took at the, my house and they're all different types of local bees. So there's some green ones, there's some, you know, bumblebees, different bumblebees. One on the right hand side is like super, super tiny. It's less um, like it's it's smaller than a little dime. Yeah. And they emerge at different times. So some were in the fall, some were in the spring. And so another thing also that um, I wanted to bring forward is the need for us to change our mindset. So, you know, traditional gardening says if you see a leaf being eaten, it's bad. Like that means you got to get some pesticides and you got to start your pest management things. Like we want to spread the word out there that if it's not getting eaten, it's not part of the ecosystem. And to illustrate my point, I wanted to share with you some pictures I took of this is like in the uh, flat uh, tail leaf cutter bees. So the picture in the middle, I didn't take it, but what they do is they go around, they use that little like uh, you can see they have like a little jaw there and they cut the leaves and then they use those leaves to like make little cocoons for their babies. And so on the left hand side, you can see the pictures of my obedient plant that got eaten by those bees. And then on the right hand side, uh, I took that picture of um, plant, like these bees uh, in my garden. And I want to let you know that even though when you look at the obedient plant, you think, oh, my God, it's never going to survive. It's been so depleted and so forth. And it was fine, like it bloomed in the year. And so if you have plants in your garden, I encourage you to think about, about that and ask yourself, like, if it's not being used by anybody, like it doesn't belong in the ecosystem and maybe something better and more um, ecologically sound can replace it. Another myth also that we wanted to bust uh, to tonight is that native gardens uh, don't, don't necessarily have to look messy. So these are pictures from the Fletcher's Wildlife Garden. I encourage you to go have a look at that garden. It's beautiful and it's near the uh, experimental farm. Um, you can have like modern looking native gardens. You can have more traditional um, English cottage gardens. Uh, it's not because it's a native garden that it has to be a meadow and has to look weedy and messy like you can actually design it the way that you want to design it also like a, another important message is to leave the leaves even at this time of the year um like our leaves they provide habitat for numerous species i put some of the pictures that i took myself um, mostly in my garden to just give you an idea. And so, you know, some bumblebees like will um, hibernate like in the winter and then the leaves provide a bit of, you know, shelter from the snow and so forth. At the bottom is a fire, um, lightning, lightning bug, sorry. And so uh, they live in leaf litter for like a year before they emerge and, um, and so they need us to keep the leaves there so then they don't disappear. Uh, leaves provide, you know, like shelter for togs and also uh, some caterpillars will also overwinter with them. They're called like leaf rollers. So they will climb up the trees in the fall, wrap themselves in the leaves. And then sometimes during the winter, they fall on the ground. And then if we go and take those leaves away, we're also uh, getting rid of beautiful butterflies. And then finally, I put a little nest at the top because um, maybe like if you wait and not clean your garden, you'll see like it around like April, May-ish, like, you know, robins and birds taking the leaves away and using them to make uh, nests. And so they also provide nesting uh, habitat. So another quiz 
if it's sold as native in nurseries, I can trust that it's native to this region. So we see that a lot when we go to nurseries these days. Uh, native plants are starting to be trendy. If they're calling it native, does that really mean it's native? True or false? Good job, people. I'm proud of you. <laughs> yes. It's false. Unfortunately, it's not because it's branded native or white flowers that it is. And for us, the seed library, we use what we call Vascane. So it's like a database. Uh, it's a peer reviewed database um, across Canada made of like museums and scientists and so forth. And they decide what is called native into um, in our province and in our country. And so um, this is the scientific data, uh, database we use to know if it's native or not. And so I encourage you to check before buying to make sure if buying native is important to you uh, to go on that uh, website. At this time of the year, you can also help some of our bees. Like we say that, like uh, save the bees, save the bees, save the bees. Well, you can also help save cavity nesting bees. Um, you're going to start seeing on Facebook things that say like, uh, oh, like uh, wait until it's 10 uh, Celsius to clean your garden and so forth. Um, different species over winter at different times and they will emerge at different times. And so for bees, it's not necessarily related to temperature because they emerge at different times. And so what we encourage you to do is always leave the stems if you can. If your stems are hollow, and the hollow stem is exposed, we ask you to not touch them and just leave them like forever uh, because there might be bees or insects inside. And um, if, you know, right at this time of the year, you don't see hollow stems or pity stems are not exposed, you can also chop, chop them like, you know, a, a little bit over a feet high. And so that will also provide a, a habitat for the cavity nesting bees. Um, and other things also, another thing also you can uh, do to help is to leave tree stumps and logs uh, because, you know, woodpeckers, that's a woodpecker uh, picture I took in the green belt. Um, they will, you know, develop like little cavities and then the bees will go and nest in them. And so if, when you leave like uh, stumps and logs around, like the, the bees can also decide to go in those cavities to nest. So that's also helpful. Um, another also message that we have for you is that it's not because you can see some plants outside in the wild that it's necessarily native. Uh, as I mentioned, we have some introduced plants in Canada. Um, some introduced plants become what's called invasive. So an invasive plant means that it's detrimental to um, from an ecology, ecological perspective and also from an economic impact, sometimes both. And so we ask you to um, ID things on your property. Um, I put here that you can use the SEEK app by iNaturalist. Uh, that information is used by scientists uh, to conduct research. There's also like other you know, apps available you can use. Um, and then once you've identified your plants, if some are invasive, you can look up on the Ontario Invasive Plant Council to know how to do, um, get rid of them. And the city of Ottawa also asks us to um, take invasive species, put them in black garbage bags, leave them in the sun for one to two weeks, and then after that, put in the garbage, no compost, and don't give them away to your neighbors. And you can also use the EDD Maps app to identify where they are, if they're in nature. So that helps also scientists across Ontario to monitor their spread. Somebody put in the chat that one of their question was where to buy native plants locally. And so we're pretty lucky that we have several um, native nurseries locally. There's a cultivated art, Solid Agro Farm, more on the Quebec side, and Beaux-Arts also, uh, they deliver like uh, different times of the year, like in Ontario, in the Ottawa, so you can order and they will bring your stuff here. There's Fletcher Wildlife Garden, which I mentioned. You can also go and check out their garden. And also uh, Ferguson Tree Nursery. 
Um, they also have a good tree selection. And again, you can use like VASCAM, the database I mentioned to you, to confirm that they are native to Ontario. So that's it for my presentation today. Like I, I encourage you to follow us. Uh, we're pretty active on Facebook. So if you have Facebook, so we share a lot of information about native plant gardening, native plants, and also like uh, the ecology in general. And we also have an Instagram account. Um, we uh, have our uh, website where you can have like uh, access to resources on how to design your garden, for example, and how to grow seeds. And that's where our catalog will be when it's available. And I also have put the, my Gmail email address if you have any questions for me. So um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Comments also as good suggestions. Oh, question number one. I planted some native plants last year. Do I need to do anything to help them this year? Um, so how big were they when you planted the plants? Like, did you plant them this big in the fall or seedlings? Uh, so I would keep an eye on them, like uh, to water them, to make sure that they're established depending on when you sow them. Um, we don't recommend like a uh, heavy mulching. Um, and so we don't you you don't feel don't feel the need to like put a lot of mulch between your uh, your your plants. Uh, we prefer to use what's called like green mulching. So if you have like leaves or like grass clippings or things like that, that's a good way to um, fertilize your soil and making sure also that uh, you provide some of the um, habitat for ground nesting bee. Is that useful? Did I answer your question? Dean, do you want to ask your question now? Yeah, okay. Um, I was actually writing the question, but can you hear uh, me? Yes. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I obtained some seeds from the seed library in the fall. I get a fly plant, and I planted them in a in a container. Okay. And, and they're right now in the garage. Okay. But I don't know what to do next. Okay. And so um, you can bring them outside. When? Like any time. Oh, because they're in, in the, it's the garage is cold. Yes, but they're going to need sun uh, soon. And I have a window in the garage. Can I put them by the window? Because I don't want yes. to. Yeah. Yes, it should work, but you need to keep them moist. So if you don't put them outside, you might need to water them. Okay, because I haven't watered them at all since I planted them. Okay, so they need like cold, moist stratification. So they need to be cold for a certain period of time, depending on how long it takes for each species. And then they need to be kept moist, so then they germinate. Okay. And so in your garage, if you don't water them, they're going to be too dry. Uh -huh. And they're also going to need to have access to sunlight. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll do that then. Thank you. And don't put them on a, in a south-facing spot because that's too much sun. Okay. When you put them outside, so for, it's preferable to put them like in the north-facing spot or um, east-facing spot. And should I cover them with the net netting? Yes, if you have some, that's good. That's a good practice or a screen or. Okay. Like some people okay. have even used like a like onion um, plastic. Uh, uh huh. Okay. So it's just, it's not mandatory. It's just to prevent like squirrels from digging in and things like that. Okay. So okay. if you don't have it, it's not a must, but it's a best practice. Okay. Thank you. Is that useful? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, I have a couple questions. I'm uh, starting my first garden ever um, and I wanted to do it with native species, okay. um, but one of the questions or concerns that I have is um, my garden like is shared with my neighbor like mm. it's a condo so it's shared with the unit beside me mm. so they have shrubs on their half and I just wanted to kind of make sure I'm making choices that won't kind of like negatively impact their side of the garden mm. so is there anything to watch out for um, in terms of choosing native species that won't kind of uh, like 
harm my the other side of a garden or a shrub um, that won't kind of spread too much or, uh, or anything like that. Yeah, so there's two ways that they typically um, spread, either by what's called like rhizomes. And so those are like uh, root-based, and that's kind of like seeds will pop, like plants will pop up here and there. So I think you want to avoid those because that means they're going to pop in your neighbor's uh, garden. And uh, there are some plants that just reproduce by seeds. So that's probably a good choice because you can deadhead them and mm -hmm. then keep the seeds to donate for the seed library. That's what I do for my stuff. Like I deadhead them okay. as I move along and I make sure that don't plant uh plants that spread by uh, rhizomes or the root system okay and if i can be uh selfish and ask a follow-up um yes so of when course. i'm starting my first garden so the garden that was there um yeah. from before i moved in they had just planted some grass seed in the little area okay. and um to start that for like a native plant garden um i know that a lot of the times it's kind of just taking what's there but if you have existing grass you need to oh, remove yes. that before you start your garden like oh, okay. pull that out really and kind of question and so what we recommend is like a like very simple you can put cardboard and newspaper on top of it and then just like make it make sure that it's a uh, wet like it's like it remains moist and so that will kill your lawn so you don't have to dig because when you dig you okay. disrupt like a root system and you know, there's like a canal between plants and fungi that provide nutrients and things like that. And so removing the turf and things like that, that's not the best practice. Like if you can just put something on top to just kill the grass and then you can put a little bit of compost or soil on top and then plant your um, seedlings in there. Um, myself, like I, so I did that for my garden, like for the fr there's no more lawn in the front of my property except for a little strip. And so I did that. Uh, I started it in this springtime. And then in the like I grew tired of waiting for the grass to die. And so basically I treated the cardboard like you would for um, you know, like the black plastic fabric that you, sometimes you can buy at stores though. And people use that to prevent like weeds from growing. So I treat my cardboard like that. So I I took a pair of scissors and I drew a little hole in it and I Put my seedlings in it so then because okay. i kind of grew tired of waiting <laughs> <laughs> okay so you just you were you cutting holes in the cardboard that you yeah. have on top of the grass and then planting the seeds yeah. in the ground under the cardboard yeah so it's best to okay. start the seeds in pots or the shell like clam shells or um the containers as i've shown you um right. because um if you like you're not going to get good germination ra germination rates if you just sprinkle them on top because you have it just existing vegetation, different species grow at different rates. And so like something that's more like um, generous can take over the other stuff. And also like it might be eaten by squirrels or, because you know, it's part of the ecosystem. So it's going to be eaten mm -hmm. or blown in the mm -hmm. wind or whatever. And so it's better if you start them in pots and then you place them where you want. And so when you place them where you want, like we recommend when you design things that you grow at least like three to five plants of the same species together, because mm -hmm. bees will go from one like plant, like the same, they will eat the same species, one species at a time. Mm -hmm. And so if you have several of the same plants together, it's easier for them. So they will go like okay. all the milkweed at one time, and then they will go to the St. John's work. And so if you just have one here and there, like it's a lot more work for them. So if you can place chunks of things, that's yeah. more useful to them. And also it's more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, if you just throw a bunch of seeds everywhere, that's where people think that it's messy and things like that. Whereas if you can show that there's some thought process that went into it and you have chunks of plants, that looks a little bit more like designed and thought of. So it kind of achieves the, several purposes at the same time. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. You can send me an email if you have other questions after or reach out on Facebook. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Melanie, there's another one in the chat from Ashley. Okay. Do you see that one or you want me to read it? 
Oh, that's okay. I can't read it. I have siblings from the library as well. Keep kept outside all winter. At what point can they be transplanted to the garden? And they will be generally self seed. I have nodding onion, butterfly milkweed, black eyed Susans, and one another I can't recall. And so it dip, yeah. So you want to transplant them when they're about like three inches tall. And so that's kind of when they are the right size to be able to transplant it. And I can't give you a specific timeline because they grow at different rates. And so it's more you looking at it and then assessing or they're big enough or not. If you crammed a bunch of seeds in the same pot, maybe you're going to get like tiny, tiny seedlings like this big and a huge amount of them all crammed together in one pot. Then you might need to take these tiny seedlings and then put them in bigger pots before they reach the three inch tall uh, height that we recommend. And will they generally sell seeds? So if I look at the species you have, nodding onion, I think I'm growing it for the first time this year. I think so, I'm not sure. Butterfly milkweed, um, not that much. Like you, like uh, I have had, I've been growing butterfly milkweed in different places for four years now, and they don't really spread. Uh, Black eyed Susan will sell seed happily. Uh, they're like, you know, annual or biannual seeds, and, and they come back uh, year to year. And then the other one, I don't know, because you can't recall. <laughs> Did I answer your questions, Ashley? Yeah, I'm going to assume yes. Okay, good. The seed library will be giving away seedlings, so if you haven't winter sown any seeds this year, you can still get plants to start your garden. Yes, Janine, thank you, Janine, good point. We will be giving away uh, free plants uh, starting June. I should have had the date ready. Uh, June 17. So if you go on our website, uh, you can uh, check out all of our upcoming events. And so this, this will be our free plant exchange event, no donations required. So basically people take all the extra seedlings that they have from the seeds they sown, they bring it all under the tent and around it, and people that have extra plants too, and you can grab some to add to your garden. Ah, okay, thank you, Christina. Her nodding on it doesn't sell seed much. So that's what I thought too, but I wasn't sure. So thanks, Christina. Any other questions or comments? Oh, Janine, my nodding onion has been spreading quite a lot. Janine's plants, though, are very happy in her garden. She put composted mulch, and uh, I don't know what's happening when the, where she lives, but they're really happy. So <laughs> we should all add the composted mulch. <laughs> Any other questions for me, comments? Oh, yeah, Laura. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Good. Nice to see you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work for Laura back in the day. <laughs> and Janine gave a really great uh, presentation at oh, our yes! Cub group. It was so fantastic. Aww. So anyways, just wanted to thank you again for that. They had an amazing time. Um, but tied to that, actually, the principal of my kid's school heard about that presentation. And he's interested in trying to get some projects going potentially for native wildflowers in the schoolyard. So oh, I was just nice. wondering about the seedling sale, like, or not sale, but free event. Yeah. Is priority access, is there options for priority access for schools or do we just show up and take plants or how yeah, does it work if it's a parent council? Plants, but uh, if you send me a message, I can try to hook you up with people that I know will have extra seedlings and they can give you some. <laughs> awesome. Thank if you. If you have contacts, no one. But uh, yeah, at the event, like people would just bring uh, their start, sort of, but I've already had people contacting me and saying that they were growing things to donate to a group. So I'm happy. Awesome. To, happy okay, thank that. you. You're welcome. Thank you for the shout out to Janine. Any other questions or comments? No, okay. So Jane or Sarah, 
Yes, so I just want to thank everybody for coming. And Melanie, merci beaucoup for une excellente présentation. It was so nice to see you all out here on this on this stormy, stormy day. So I hope we've seen we've seen the last of the storm. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I think the councillor has lost power. Um, so I'll oh. thank you all on behalf of her. Um, we really appreciate you coming out. And like Melanie said, feel free to reach out to her with any further questions. And if you don't have her contact information, reach out to our office and we can put you in touch. Um, once again, we have the invasive plant removal dog strangling vine workshop coming up at the end of April. I believe it's on the 27th. It's not on our website quite yet, but it will be. So if you're interested in that and getting involved with the removal efforts in the ward, um, feel free to join us then as well. So thank you all. Um, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.